Welcome to MindShift. I'm Brandon. Today is episode 17 of our Secular Bible Study series, in which we are looking at Esther. Esther is a very strange book within the contents of the canon, primarily because it does not feature God at all. It is an absolute story, totally contrived. We have purposeful irony. We have reversal of situations and fortunes. We have very convenient plot devices, etc. This is like a Shakespearean play. You could really just watch it acted out. It's only 10 chapters. Chapters, and yet so much happens. Why this was included in the canon, I mean, I definitely understand and we'll get into it, but at the same time, this book could have been left out. The events are taking place about a hundred years after captivity, so we've already had, you know, we've been going in pretty good chronological order here. We've already had Ezra and Nehemiah and Zerubbabel and everyone with their three waves from captivity in Babylon owned by the Persians go back into the holy city, get to return. But not all the Jews returned. Many were still in captivity and under the Persian rule. And that's where this story is. So again, a hundred years, this would be maybe 30 to 40 years after Nehemiah went back to start working on the walls. And we have a good cast of characters here, but four main ones. So let's just dive right into point one, which is going to be book overview. And I'm going to give you a pretty good summary of this book. And this is where most of the meat is going to be, because as we progress through learning about each book of the Bible, sometimes I think it'll be more important to understand the themes. Sometimes I think it's definitely going to be more important to focus on the problematic passages and the contradictions. I'll give you a spoiler alert. This one doesn't have much because it's a human story. Yes, we can assume that God is contriving these things to happen, and that is going to be problematic. So we have some things to say in point seven, but not as much as in a book like Numbers. So what I really want you to get from this, even though I want you to pay attention till the end, is to hear the summary. So as we look back on it in future books, you can be aware. Plus, it's a really interesting story. We have Mordecai and Esther. These are our main two Jewish characters. Mordecai is the uncle to his niece, Esther. And then we have the king of Persia himself and one of his top officials. Not quite sure what his status was. He was elevated to the highest in the kingdom, but in terms of like what role specifically was he in charge of, I'm not very clear on the Persian politics of the day. And his name is Haman. So these four, 10 chapters, and I'm going to just look at it in the Bible here so that I can remind myself of what happens in each chapter, and we will walk through it in that fashion. Guys, we are getting so close. Next week is Job. Job used to be my favorite book. Now I think it's definitely in contention for one of the worst books in the Bible. I cannot wait to talk about it. Then we're getting to Psalms and Proverbs. Like We are really, really moving places. So Okay, we start off in chapter one, the king's banquets. Now he has two banquets that go essentially half a year. And it's just to show how rich and powerful and how grandiose his lifestyle is, etc. He has a queen, Queen Vashti. And during one of these parts of the banquet, he says for her to come out so that everyone can look upon her and see what a good thing this king has. And she is in no mood for it. The king is drunk. He is not having that disobedience. And he's so offended by her denial that he and all the other rulers think this is bad. We don't want women thinking they can just not do what they're told. I can't let her remain queen. So he removes her from that position. He's going to have a beauty pageant essentially to pick the next queen. That's where Esther is going to come in. But first he needs to make a royal decree. The Persians, at least according to the biblical account of Esther love their decrees. We get tons of these. And he wants to make sure that all the women who might have seen what Vashti did don't get any ideas. And so he makes a decree that men are to be elevated among women, no matter their status, the men's status, that is. So then we get to chapter two, where Esther becomes queen. So again, he lines up all these women. He's got a harem. He has this huge pageant. He wants to see who is the most beautiful. Only the most beautiful can come and be my queen. Now, important note, she's not letting him know that she is a Jew. This is her and Mordecai's little plot. Get her in good because who knows, maybe God will use her. I think it's right here that's interesting to note that there is just a ton of what we would consider sin. Drunkenness is everywhere. The parties, the festivities, the mistreatment of women. There's a lot of sex in this book. There is a lot of partying, etc. And we don't get any condemnation on it. Uh, uh, this is happening by Mordecai and by Esther. They are partaking and no different than any of the other Persians. And so 
one thing, and I guess we'll save this for point seven, but is the inconsistency of God's moral law for the Jewish people. But I digress for now. The next thing that happens at the end of chapter two is that Mordecai just so happens, like I said, very Shakespearean, very convenient plots here to have him overhear a couple of guards who are planning to assassinate the king. So Mordecai tells Esther and Esther tells the king, and now Mordecai gets credit for saving the king's life. This will be important later on, even if it is immediately forgotten for the sake of the king convenience of the story. Now you have two Jewish people that are in the king's good graces, though the king does not know this. How can we balance this out for the sake of a good story? I know. Let's introduce a fourth character right now that will be opposed to the Jews, and this is Haman. Haman, if you track his lineage, is actually a Canaanite. Wow, look how this turned out. Again, contrived to the utmost. And the king is really impressed with Haman, elevates him all the way to the highest, and forces every single person to kneel before Haman. Well, guess who conveniently does not want to kneel? Mordecai. So now we've got this rivalry, this Israelite and this Canaanite, although right now it's considered just a Jew and an Agite. Haman can't stand that Mordecai would not kneel and so comes up with the plot plan here to kill all the Jews and he convinces the king to do so. Let's make a decree and annihilate these people. And the king just goes along with it. The king here is really just a plot device to move any part of the story along. He's saying yes to this, forgetting what he needs to forget, remembering what he needs to remember. It's just really... I don't want to I don't want to knock this like this is good storytelling. There's actually a lot of really interesting symmetry and irony and things that are happening, but it's so convenient. It's hard to look past. And again, when you're trying to pass this off as the inspired word of God and that these events actually happened. It's very, very hard to believe that. So the king agrees, they make the royal decree, but they need to pick a day for when this is going to happen. And so they roll the dice. This is, you've probably heard of this at some point in literature, Haman's die, or the Hebrew word for it being poor, which is going to get us to the Jewish holiday of Purim. So this is going to happen almost a full year later, which is great. Again, this really helps a lot of things be able to happen in the meantime. The Jews just get to stay alive for almost another year. It's like 11 months later that this death day is going to come before for seemingly no reason at all, the king has agreed to completely wipe them out. Now, something interesting happens here. Supposedly, this is public knowledge that this decree has happened. In fact, Haman and the king and all the other royal officials had a big party about it. And it seems like everyone Jewish wise is very distressed. You would think this would be a good time to, I don't know, have a uprising, try to get message back to the Jews in the homeland and get them to come do some conquering. Like what happened to the old school fighting spirit here. But for this story, that can't work because we need Esther to be the hero. And it's interesting because even Mordecai and, and Esther kind of have a conversation about this back and forth. Mordecai's like, don't do it. You can't go to the king with this. It's against the law. God will find another way to get us out of this jam. Don't worry about it. And she's like, no, I got this. She quotes the famous lines, if I perish, I perish, which I really like, by the way. And she decides after asking everyone to fast that she is going to go and present this to the king. We see this very similar with Nehemiah when he wants to go back and build the walls. He fasts. He has everyone around him fast before he goes and make this request to the king. Okay, we're getting into chapter five and a lot of really funny things start to happen, or I should say ironic things start to happen. So Esther wants to make this request and so she makes a banquet. And she says to both the king and Haman, like, hey, I've got a special request. I'm going to have another banquet for you tomorrow. And they're like, OK, I guess everything is done around banquets and decrees. So Haman leaves. He's super drunk. And who does he run into conveniently? Like you would think there's only 10 people in this city. Haman runs into Mordecai. He's drunk. He's furious. He's remembering that Mordecai didn't kneel. And he's like, I'm going to kill you tomorrow. I'm going to get the king's blessing and I won't wait the 11 months for you. In fact, I'm going to impale you on a huge stake. And he commissions to have it built. Then the next morning, as he goes to the king to get permission, something interesting has happened. The king couldn't sleep last night. The king had his royal people read him his royal stories about the great chronicles of his life, which included the fact that Mordecai saved his life, which he had conveniently forgotten. And so this is fresh on his mind. Haman's coming saying, hey, I want to kill this guy, Mordecai. And the king says, no, I want you to honor Mordecai. Lead him around on a horse throughout the city so that everyone can see this great man. So Mordecai is elevated. Haman goes lower and 
lower, which is going to end poorly for him because the next thing that happens is that banquet the next day where Esther says, hey, you know what? I'm Jewish. So is my man Mordecai. He is related to me. Remember how Haman wanted to kill him? And the king, drunk as always, is so happy with Esther, so in love with her. He doesn't care that she's Jewish and he's really mad at Haman all of a sudden. So he has Haman killed on the very stake that Haman had prepared for Mordecai, Vlad the Impaler style. So I also want to point out that there's different interpretations from the Hebrew words here. If he was impaled on a stake, if he was hung, some even think he was crucified. It seems to be that impaled on a stake is the best guess, although even my version here, the ESV, is talking about him being hung on the gallows. Wanted to point that out. So that happens in chapter 7. In chapter 8, Esther bakes the king to save the Jews. He agrees, but it's not so simple. He already made that first decree with Haman about the death date for the Jews. So everyone gets really creative and they make another decree that gives the Jewish people the right to fight back, which again, it's like, wouldn't they have done this anyways? But I guess maybe they can fight back against anyone that would choose to follow the first decree without the king sending other people to quash it. I don't know, but it's important that they do this other decree that allows the Jews to go on the defensive and then even on a second day to go on the offensive to anyone that has potentially harmed them. And so we get lots of fun, death and destruction. And then to celebrate this, we get the Feast of Purim uh, inaugurated in chapter nine and in chapter 10, it's all about the greatness of Mordecai, who is now in a position, it seems like he takes Haman's position and that's how the book ends. So again, lots of reversals of fortunes and symmetry and parallelism and all kinds of stuff that I've already now spoiled point four. So let's move straight into point two, which is authorship and date. So traditionally in Judaism, this gets accredited to Mordecai. However, we definitely know that the book is authored anonymously. We have good reason to believe it was written in the fourth century BCE. In fact, we have some good dating here because we're talking about the king's name is King Ahasuerus, which is also known as Xerxes I. We know Xerxes would have been 486 to 465 BCE, and that dating aligns with the customs that we are hearing so much about these Persian customs, which is kind of cool. We'll get into that in point three. So that's really it for authorship and date. This is probably, again, like all of these other books about exile composed during the time of exile, which is interesting because typically when we've said during the time of exile, we meant when all the Jews were still in captivity. But now we've had three different waves go and we just have a segment of Jews left in captivity. So probably during this exile, if not shortly afterwards, even while there's still more exile going on as the Jews are starting to get an upper hand in the Persian rulers. So let's get into point three, which is historical context, accuracy, background, etc. And we do in this book get so much insight. We've gotten a little bit from Ezra, a little bit from Nehemiah on how the Persian rulers ruled and who they were and what dates they were around and how they took over Nebuchadnezzar and took over Babylon and how they really enjoyed giving freedoms back to people because they found it easier to control with four in rule. Plus, this is great for tax purposes to kind of get your people back out working, creating, building, etc., but still have dominion over them. And you get to look like the good guy. I mean, the Persians are just nothing but praised by the books of the Old Testament. So we see political, we see social, we see cultural norms of the Persian Empire at this time. I personally think it's really neat to see the Persian customs come so alive, you know, even having the king ask his guards or his tenants to read back the cross to him as he's falling asleep, or we see these different feasts that are going on and well, they were in the courtyard drinking wine at that time. And you just get this real vision of what it would be like to be in the court of the Persian rulers. Funny enough, though, that's going to make this historical fiction because this book is obviously, again, completely contrived and put together specifically. There's no good reason to think that these individuals actually existed. We're using a period of time with Xerxes I and the Persian rule of Babylon and other neighboring cities, etc., to say, let's insert our characters here and have this miraculous thing happen. Let's have this great hero story, this underdog story, a woman nonetheless, etc., to save the people from a specific date of total annihilation. Talk about 
mythical, even though it's done on such a human level. I think that's really all there is to say about it. Yeah, ton of cultural insight, ton of cultural context, but no particular accuracy with the details other than the name of the king, right? It's like uh, Abe Lincoln, the Vampire Slayer, whatever that book was. Like you got one person right. Like here's the ruler. Here's the years that he was alive. Let's make up this entire fiction associated with it. So let's move on to point four, which is literary analysis. I've already talked about this in great detail, the parallelism, the irony that is used, the reversal of fortunes, the framing certain scenes against each other, right? Like you have the rise of Haman, the rise of Mordecai. You have the feast that is to celebrate the decision to annihilate the Jews and the feast of Purim to celebrate when the Jews actually ended up conquering their would-be conquerors. You get the downfall of the original beautiful queen and the uprising of the new beautiful queen Esther. You get the stake that was prepared for Mordecai's death, but is actually Haman's death as Haman comes down the rungs as Mordecai goes up. Like it is all very well crafted. We have a lot of suspense and timing and even humor and foreshadowing. We see a really healthy amount of character development and understanding Esther and seeing her from this kind of timid, should I, should I not? Mordecai's kind of talking in her ear all the way to Mordecai kind of saying like, no, you don't have to do this. And she's like, if I perish, I perish. So again, for all these reasons, I think it's a really cool book to have in the Bible. I just think it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to be included in the canon. I mean, the most interesting thing about the literary analysis of this book is its absence of explicitly religious content. But Let's move on to main themes. I think that one is going to be divine providence, even though this doesn't get explicitly said and associated with God. There are little hints of it when Mordecai is like, hey, you know, I'm fasting, I'm doing the sackcloth and ash thing, I'm running through the streets crying about this. But Esther, you don't have to do this. God's going to get us out of this. And then he has this little line in there, I think it's in chapter five or six, where he says, or maybe you becoming queen was his plan all along, something to that extent, where the confidence is there that the Jews will not be totally annihilated. It's just a matter of how God is going to deliver them. He's always delivered them before. Look at the last three waves of people that went home. Look at all those times we were under oppression of the Canaanites and got out of it. Look at when we were in Egypt in slavery and got out of it, etc. Right? So they have this, or at least Mordecai, speaking for the people, has this confidence of divine intervention and providence and that they as a chosen and people will not be totally destroyed. It's funny too, because even Esther has a line somewhere in there when she's talking to the king and she's like, listen, like if it wasn't going to be this total destruction, I wouldn't have said anything. If you were just going to sell us as slaves, like that's your right to do, right? Because as long as they're existing, they can someday get back to the providence. But when it comes to them being actually completely killed off, you know, we've got to do something bigger here. So again, lots of fascinating little tidbits and interactions here. So I would say divine providence for a second theme, I would say identity. And I'm going to tie that in with like a third one, courage. So we'll say points two and three would be identity and courage. The whole identity thing here of Esther hiding her Jewishness, Mordecai not hiding his, choosing to kneel before a Canaanite or not kneel before a Canaanite, etc. There's a lot to do with what it means to be Jewish, what it means to be part of this chosen group, how these people are supposed to play their part in that, etc. And then the courage to do so, right? So we're not saying, hey, Esther, who hid her Jewishness, is a coward. She's smart. And when the time comes, she's going to use that and she's going to be courageous enough to lay it on the line. But maybe she needs to work her way in first, where Mordecai is just like, I've got nothing to lose. God will protect me or at least our people group. Let's do this. I kneel for no one. And so the courage courage of the Jewish people here. Again, it's, it is propaganda at the end of the day. If, if you look at all of these Old Testament books so far, it's one group of people who has declared themselves better than everyone else to the creator of the universe, the only ones with a set purpose, the ones with the most powerful God. They would have been believing at this time still in a pantheon of gods, at least most of them, but they have the best one. It's like the people who followed Zeus and didn't care so much about some of the other sub gods. And everything they've written is Jewish propaganda. God delivers us. God allows us to have slaves. You can't though. God gives us all the riches. God gives us all the victories. Like it really is interesting. And this is just a unique new way of doing so. They wrote themselves an underdog story because they also have to work it into the true events that happened. And there's no getting around that they went into captivity for these many long decades. But within that captivity, what keeps happening? 
oh, they keep rising to the top in government. We saw this back with what happened in Egypt. We see it now with what's happening in Babylon and under the Persians. They always get a high seat at the table. They're always the one that impresses the king. They always have the greatest beauty, the smartest men, the strongest men, etc. Like, I'm not trying to be anti-Semitic at all. I'm saying in the historical account of the Jewish people putting these stories together, it was a self-pride and again, a propaganda as a people of look who we are, look what we can do. So I think it's really fascinating to kind of view the Bible through that context. Let's move on to point six though, which is reception influence, which I think I did just cover a little bit. Like it is getting passed down. Here we have a lot of things. The if I perish, I perish. The Haman's die. We have these concepts that have definitely trickled down into literature specifically. I mean, the if I perish, I perish has been repeated so many times in so many ways as this statement of sheer courage in the face of probable demise. Haman's die, this this roll of the dice, this casted lot that will decide the fate of when your time is up. I think that that is such a unique and interesting device that has been utilized in all kinds of gambling analogies, you know, roll of the dice, uh, shuffle of the deck, etc. Like this is very common to be associated because it's something that's out of our control, but it's also something that is fated. And I think that even having the Feast of Purim based off that word for die is such a cool way to kind of own that and and take that back. So the reception influence is really cool from this story. Also, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention having a heroine. This is, you know, one of the first times other than maybe Ruth. And for a time period and a group that is so misogynistic, it is interesting to have these little stories of leading women. But let's move on to point seven and talk about contradictions and problematic passages, though I don't think we're going to cover all that many. A couple quick contradictions. In Esther 9, we get that the Jewish people killed 75,000 of their enemies, just with what we know about the Persians who would not have been attacking them at this time under the rule. And the numbers left in captivity at this point, like this number seems incredibly exaggerated, near impossible. Another one here is just in, in context, the historical reality of the Persians accepting non-Persian or specifically Jewish people so high up in their ranks like Mordecai is clearly fiction. Again, I, I know I've already mentioned like this is fiction, but not just the fact that it happened, that even that it could happen. Mordecai would not have climbed the ranks like this, would have never been granted a position. This is what we know from the study and documentation we have on the Persian rulers. I don't know if it's more of a contradiction or a problematic passage, but in Esther 2, we see Esther taking an oath to Mordecai that she will not reveal her Jewishness. And then in Esther 7, she obviously does. So problematic passage, oaths mean nothing. And this would have been consequential to her being murdered for this, but no big deal because now she's saving the Jewish people. Again, I've been talking a lot about God's subjective morality when it comes to what he needs to have happen. The punishments, they kind of get overlooked and the things that are terrible somehow get elevated to beneficial. Really interesting. So again, contradiction within the Book and also just highly problematic. There's a weird, and I've heard it explained, but these women for the beauty pageant were supposed to undergo a 12 month beautifying ritual before they were presented to the king. Yet after just one night with the eunuch, Esther is able to go before the king the next day. So yeah, that could be just an exception that is made, but it's definitely contradicting to what we are told these women have to do before they can go to the king. Mordecai's actual position is interesting. We always hear about him being at the gate. This is why conveniently, you know, this is a good place for him to be because it allows him these interactions with Haman. But we also hear that his position is in the king's palace palace. Those would be two totally different roles. And it seems like, again, a plot device to get him to be in the right place at the right time to overhear the things he needs to overhear, but also to be outside the gate to be able to have these interactions with people as they leave. Like it's it's very messy. So, you know, there's some other things, but really this book is so self-contained and so theologically lacking that there's just not a lot of contradictions to pull from. In terms of problematic passages, kind of the same thing here. We, we have a couple we can talk about. One thing, and maybe this is back to a contradiction that's really interesting, is 
is the original queen from chapter one who can't even say no to her husband and creates the fact that an entire new law needs to be written that these men can't be questioned than to immediately have Esther do so much more than all of that to such an extent and have it be so well received. Like these decrees are either like ironclad or they're completely exempt. It's it's really interesting just again how this is all working out for the characters. It's like someone didn't think the story through that well, but I don't know. Is it problematic to God's character, which is what we usually talk about? No. Let's see. What else? Oh, again, I'm not sure where to fit this. Haman seems to immediately after his negative encounter with Mordecai, though he doesn't know Mordecai is Jewish, but that's what leads him to wanting to annihilate all of the Jews. But then we find out later that he figures out Mordecai is Jewish. Like it, it doesn't make any sense. I guess I find myself still talking about contradictions. You know, another one here is like Esther's telling everyone to fast for three days that they need to do this, which you would usually wait till the time of fasting is over before you present your request, but she seems to do so immediately that same day. Like this whole thing is just baffling. But is there anything in this story that is problematic for the character of God? Well, if there is, it's going to come to us at the very end when the Jewish people get the go-ahead from the Persians to start eliminating their enemies. We do have all of chapter nine being about the Jews destroying their enemies. I think it's self-defense or preservation. Like I don't want to nitpick or die on a hill that's totally not worth dying on. I think the level of harm that they go through, even the revenge on Haman, they kill all, I think nine of Haman's sons. That would probably be the biggest thing I would point to. Again, killing 500 people really quick in the hall and then an additional 75,000 as they go place to place seems a little bit like a hunt versus a self-defense. But again, there is still the decree that on this day, all these Jews will be killed. So putting up an offense does not necessarily mean it is not a defense. I don't know if I want to try to make that claim in this particular book, but some of the words that are used are that of revenge, not self-defense, especially when it comes to Haman's family that is completely taken down, which seems like it would have been unnecessary, right? Like if the king ordered Haman to be killed, like, yeah, the family might want to go after the king and queen for that, but just choosing to kill his entire family preemptively is the kind of evils that the Bible's talked about when the shoe is on the other foot. So, I mean, I don't know. I think that's where we will end it today. The broad strokes that I want people to be able to glean from this is not, oh, here's another problematic book of the Bible. No, this is obviously one of the least problematic books. I just want you to understand the narrative and hopefully understanding the position that the Jewish people were in as they were writing these and collecting these stories. You know, they're being distributed. You have people in between, you have people still in captivity, and you have people back in the homeland. And you have disagreements everywhere with all of these different people about the right place to be. No, we should be getting favor here. We should be trying to build relations with the Persians. No, we need to get back home and do our own thing and eventually get fortified and strong enough, build these walls and be able to defend ourselves again and get back to the place that God has told us to be and await supposedly, even though this would not have been happening at the time, the Messianic King Jesus, blah, blah, blah. And so we will be coming back to these stories, especially as we get into a few more of the exile books like Haggai and talk about some of the important plot things that happened here in terms of the Persians' relationships with the Jewish people. That's the biggest thing to take away. So thanks for watching. Have a wonderful day. I will see you this Sunday with another Sunday video. And until then, keep thinking. I wanted to personally thank my top three tiers of support. First is the Iconoclast tier with GVI Precision Body and Paint, Jason Rollins, Oliver, and Sean Skaggs. Also my Atheist Advocate tier, Elijah Jeffrey, Jared Nichols, Christy Goff, and Sparky. And lastly, a huge shout out to all of my Secular Scholar tier patrons. These patron counts continue to grow as well as all the other tiers that I have listed in the description. Thank you to everyone who supports this channel. It means so very much. If you like what I'm doing on this channel or you believe in my mission, please consider supporting as well. Thanks and have a wonderful day.